Amen. Please take your Bibles and open up to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis, the fourth chapter. As you do, remember God the Father loves you and wishes to teach you something through the investigation of His Word this morning. Uh, to our guests, we know that we have a few of you. We are grateful that you are in the house of the Lord with us today, and uh, we are excited that you're here to sing and pray and study the Word of God. We, we like to call ourselves the Village Bereans because we are very passionate about studying and investigating the Word of God. And so I pray that you feel welcome today, and uh, we're going to get right to it. Here we are in Vistas, Christ in all the Old Testament. And today we look at the heart of worship in Genesis chapter 4. We have seen from uh, this study from right here in the beginning of the first uh, couple books of the Bible that God is good. In the beginning, God determines your worship, your worldview, and your work. And this God who has always been, He is the pre-existent one. He is the powerful one. He is the one with ultimate purpose. And that purpose is good purpose for us. That is good news for us today as we think about people across the other side of the, the world that are suffering right now because of war and because of violence. We have a good God who is over all things. And you say, well, how in the world if God is good? This is one of the age-old questions that people from all generations, from all different backgrounds and religions have queried. They have asked this very question. If the God of the Bible is good, then why does he not intervene? And it is a valid and legitimate question. But of course, it negates the fact that the responsibility for sin and violence and the, pref, you know, the, the proliferation of death in this world is not because of God, it's because of you and I. It's because of our own sin nature. We've learned that we as human beings, we are the apex of creation, that God demonstrated that He is good by creating you and I. His handiwork, which is complete, His heart, which is compassionate, the fact that he does hinder us by giving us commands. This is a gracious thing that God does for us. And then, of course, is help. His commitment to help us. But we, as the ones vested with the image of God, we and we alone, as the creaturely, as creatures ourselves, we are the only ones that have the image of God. We have been created with this one capacity, this one opportunity, this one this one purpose to be in relationship with our Creator. No other creature in all the created order can say this. And even though God created all things good, He created man and woman and all the things that we see and we know, the universe and the earthly realm, all of it was good. There was something that occurred that we call the fall. Sin entered into the created order and there was this very cosmic effect, this very cosmic change that occurred in the created order. And it infiltrated my heart and your heart and all the hearts of ever, uh, every other human being. But the amazing truth is that even before that God, knowing that we would fall into sin, He chose to create us anyway. There was already a sovereign plan of redemption through God the Son, Jesus Christ, even back there at the very beginning of all things, as we learn in Genesis 3 and verse 15. I shared that quote with you last week. The sum and summary of the whole Bible is found in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. 15, the first gospel, I know we like to highlight Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as the quote-unquote, the gospels. But the gospel actually is present all the way back, even before Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John were written. The gospel is present all the way back there at the beginning of all things there in Genesis chapter 3, that God the Father would provide provision for you and I as lowly, depraved sinners. He would provide provision provision for you and I, and the opportunity for redemption that we could be bought back and, and brought back and adopted back into the family of God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But as we noted last week, we do have a sin nature. You have it, I have it, we all have a sin nature, and the consequences have been devastating. I shared that with you last week. Someone asked me, uh, after the sermon last week, she said, can you run through those D's that you shared? The devil brings about what? Depravity, destruction, and ultimately death into your life. 
okay? The devil will bring about depravity. That's the sin nature. He will help you, he will, he will help you uh, enjoy that sin nature and therefore distance you further from God, destroy you, ultimately leading to your death. I'm always reminded by something that my sweet daughter did regarding the devil. One night at the dinner table, and this has been some years, she has grown in her understanding of the word of God. But she said, you know, I just feel led of the Spirit to pray for Satan tonight. I just pray that Satan could change. I pray that Satan could be saved. Let me tell you something. Satan, he he, he ain't going to be saved, okay? He is the destroyer. And God hates that which destroys his most precious creature. That's you and I as human beings. So there's coming a day when the destroyer will be himself destroyed. Satan is not redeemable. He is the only creature in his fallen minions, his fallen angels, are the only irredeemable uh, uh, creatures that we see in the created order because one day there will be a time when they are no more. But the sin nature that we have absolutely uh, has devastating consequences. Not only the depravity, not only the destruction leading to death, but we are so prone because of our sin nature to lie listening, to listen to lies. That's how, how it all started. There she is, the woman there in the Garden of Eden. And I was thinking about this. It is so good. I saw a, I saw a kind of a, an illustration about this. This is the one time and the only time in human history where the woman knew exactly what she wanted to eat. Can I get an amen, guys? Any, any, any man that's ever been in any relationship, you have that conversation. Okay, it's date night. All right, what are we going to eat? And she says, well, why don't you choose? And so you start naming off a few things. You say, well, well let's go here. No, I don't want that. Well, okay, what about these options? What about, you know, what, what about Tex-Mex or Chinese or, or barbecue or Italian? No, nah, I don't really feel. Well, what else is there? Why don't you decide? This is the one time in history when the woman knew exactly what she wanted to eat and she followed through on that. Unfortunately... Adam was right there by her side overseeing the whole thing. Before we lay the blame at Eve's feet, the woman's feet, we know the Bible tells us, especially in the New Testament, that all of this, that the sin nature has passed from from man. Each person in this room, you and I have a biological father. Therefore, the sin nature was passed from our fathers. I love my dad more than life itself. He was and is a great man. I know that he's with the Lord right now. But I received my sin nature from him. And you received your sin nature from your dad. The reason that Jesus Christ, God the Son, didn't receive a sin nature like you and I is because he had no biological father. But the sin nature is drastic. It brings about terrible things into our lives. And we see that play out even more today as we talk about the heart of worship. Worship before sin entered into the created order. The relationship that we had with Yahweh, it was perfect. There was a time, however brief it was, there was a time that Adam and Eve were in perfect relationship with Yahweh. But no more. And it affects. It changes drastically our heart of worship. And your point to ponder, Matt Redmond said it this way, and this is a guy that understands something about worship. He said, in the end, worship can never be a performance, something you're pretending or putting on. It's got to be, notice this, an overflow of your heart. Worship is about getting personal with God, drawing close to God. Now, those of you may not know the name Matt Redman. He is a prolific writer of great Christian music. Many of the, the better theologically sound and doctrinally sound songs of the last 20 or 30 years have been written by Matt Redman. And those of you know uh, his story, you'll remember that song we used to sing, not so much anymore, The Heart of Worship. And the reason he wrote The Heart of Worship, I'm coming back to The Heart of Worship. It's all about you, God. It's all about you. I'm so sorry for the things that I've made it. He was a, an up-and-coming worship and music uh, 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 leader in London. And Matt Redmond was gaining in popularity in the 
the church that he was serving at, the church that he was getting to do his music ministry at, uh, he was becoming kind of the famous one. In fact, uh, what would happen is he would play his songs and people would stand and sing and be in the presence of God. And the moment that he hit his last note, people would start piling out of out of the sanctuary. Now, I know some of y'all probably would like to do that sometime when Brother Ryan's following Alan in the choir. That's understandable. But we, we understand that we ultimately gather to hear the Word of God preached, however deficient the preaching may be. But Matt Redman, he, he understood that somehow, some way that in his the way that he was impacting the people that were there singing, that somehow he was making it about him. We need to be reminded that worship is a matter of heart. Worship is about getting personal with God, drawing close to God. The good news is that the Bible tells us all the way back here in the book of Genesis and following that the God that we serve is a personal God. He is a God that uh, is involved in my life, in your life. Even his very name, we put it on the screen last week, Yahweh Elohim, there it is in the original. You read from right to left in Hebrew. This is the special particular name of God. He is Yahweh God. There is none like him. When Moses is having his conversation with the burning bush, Moses asks, it's a good question, who do I tell them sent me? And God says, I am. He uses that first word there on the far right, Yahweh. Tell them that I am. I am. I just have always been. I am and I always will be. This is the personal God we serve. And he demands our worship. What is our worship like this morning? What is the worship in my life and your life? What does it look like if God by his spirit is examining our hearts? And he is this morning. What does he find in the way of worship? Is it genuine worship or are we just here because we know we're supposed to gather on the first day of the week in the local church? Are you here to worship this morning? With that in mind, let's go to the Word of God and we're going to learn about the heart of worship. Please stand in honor of God's holy, inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word. This is in Genesis chapter 4. And we're going to use verses 11 and 12 as our launch off text. And then we will quickly as possible walk through this chapter. And we're going to see that the heart of worship matters. Worship it can either be diluted, it can be deficient, or it can be distinct and delightful. We pray for the latter, of course. Look at verses 10 and 11 of Genesis chapter 4. Something has occurred... And then Yahweh asked a question to this one known as Cain. Yahweh said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. The Lord God said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And God said, what have you done? Of course, we know that God is all-knowing. He knew exactly what had happened. The question is more for Cain. The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened his mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Father God, we ask that this morning we come before you and we do so, hopefully, Lord, with genuine hearts of worship. It matters how we worship. Uh, Lord, I sense that today either we are indifferent about worship or maybe we are worshiping the worship. Those seem to be the two polarities. Father God, by your Spirit, call us back to yourself and remind us that it matters how we come before you in praise and prayer. In preaching and all of it, it matters how we come before you. It matters what we bring before you, the offerings we bring, the songs we sing. All of it matters. What is the state of our heart this morning? Do we have genuine hearts of worship? Are we truly all about you this morning? Are we here for ourselves? Father God, by your spirit, shine a light and illumine the 
holy writ of God right now. Remove me. I pray that is the power, the, the presence, and the person of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, that will speak to us now through His uh, inspired and errant and infallible word. Your word is sufficient, and we praise you for that. Do what you will in the remaining time we have. Remind us what it means. Show us what it means to have a genuine heart of worship. In the great name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the sovereign monarch. In his great name we pray, all of God's people said. You may be seated. Here's your life point. Again, for our guests, welcome. If you want to take some notes, you notice on the inside uh, flap of your bulletin right there, there's some lines for you to fill out. The act of worship, notice this, truly demonstrates what's in your heart, what's in my heart. Our sacrifice must be the very best of what we bring to Yahweh God. There can be no other. God is perfect. He demands the very best for us. This is from us. This is genuine worship. This is a genuine heart. And this is flowing into genuine sacrifice. Today we see that the act of worship, it will demonstrate what is in our hearts. We see it here in this kind of interplay this discussion, this recounting of this historical event of these two brothers, Cain and Abel. And we're going to see either deluded worship, which falls under the lineage of Cain, or we're going to see delighted worship, which falls and flows from the lineage of Abel. Is your worship deluded this morning, or is it delightful? I pray it is delightful, and I chose delightful over distinct because there are a lot of people that have and believe that their worship is distinct. But the fact of the matter is, there is only one worship that brings genuine happiness and contentedness and joy. That is the delight that we find in worshiping the one true God. We might say it, those who delight in genuine act of worship are doing what they were always meant to do. Jonathan Edwards, the great Puritan, said it this way, God is most satisfied in me when I am most satisfied in him. When I am most, most focused and most enamored with all the affections of my heart towards God. God is glorified in me when I am most satisfied in Him. Is He your treasure this morning? This is what it means to worship. What is in your heart? What sacrifice do you bring? Is it deluded sacrifice or is it the very best? Is it delighted? Is it something that is to the fullest and utmost that brings about your own delight before a holy and sovereign God. And so we see this interplay between deluded worship and delighted worship quickly. First of all, we see deluded worship, a weak sacrifice. We see it right here in Genesis 4, verses 1 through 3. Now the man had relations with his wife, Eve. So Adam got a chance to be with his wife, Eve, and all the men say, Amen. And she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of Yahweh. Verse 2. And again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. So she has two boys. And Abel was in keeper of flocks. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to Yahweh of the fruit of the ground. Unfortunately, nothing seems amiss here. But it actually is. We're going to see that this is actually a weak sacrifice, a weak uh, offering. This is genuinely deluded worship. This isn't worship that brings about delight in us. This is the type of worship that will cause separation between us and the Holy God. The Bible tells us here in verse 1, this word for knowing. The man had relations. That's the word for knowing. It's the word yada in Hebrew. It speaks of mutuality. It speaks of oneness. It speaks of the one flesh relationship. There's nothing in the Bible that speaks of something that is desecrated in the marital relationship when sex is involved. Sex is a wonderful thing in the marital relationship between one man and one woman. I tend to believe, as many other theologians believe, that Adam and Eve had already been together. In fact, I believe that they were together even before they fell, even before there was sin there in the created order. Why do I believe that? Because I think the Lord was showing them how much they lost in sin. Their very sexual relationship was perfected 
before sin entered into the created order. And as you remember from Genesis 3, that they were ashamed once they had open eyes of their own sin. They had this depraved nature. And now the innocence is gone. Now the function of the body, now the function of the mind is weakened. It is not what it is supposed to be totally. And yet we see here the blessing of children. Adam and Eve were together and they had two sons. The Bible tells us that the first son's name was Cain. His name, names have significance, by the way, in the Bible. You should be in the habit as you study the Word of God and you see a name. You should do your best to investigate that name because often that name has great significance. Cain's name literally means a craftsman. Some translate his name as, I have acquired, that he has come into possession of something. Either way, his name is important. And then we are going to learn about this other brother, this brother named Abel. And interestingly enough, his name is mostly associated with the word vapor. It speaks to maybe perhaps the grisly truth that, that maybe he was named after, even after his death, we don't know. But his name, Abel, means vapor, something fast, something that is here one moment and it is gone the next. By the way, Abel is not a girly man. I know we tend to look at some of these, these men in the Bible and we think that they are, are, are effeminate. Certainly we look at Jacob and Esau and we look to that story. We know that, that Jacob often is kind of considered a man of the home, and so we think that is weak. There's no connotation here regarding, like that regarding Abel. He is, he is a shepherd. He is a keeper of the sheep, and his brother is a farmer. He is a worker of the ground. These are two strong men. And so their names just demonstrate that they have different interests, different talents, has nothing to do with their character per se. But this, of course, is the beginning of kind of a long theological motif in the Bible regarding the competition between siblings, in particular, the competition between sons and brothers. We think, again, of Jacob and Esau, and then from Jacob, Joseph and his brothers and the like. The problem here is that Abel doesn't understand that he's competing with his brother. It's only his brother that's competing with him. sacrificial worship. They bring about an offering. So it came in the course of time, verse 3, that Cain, this craftsman, this man of the land, this farmer, he brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. He was a farmer. It would only make sense that he would bring grain, that he would bring the produce of the ground to the Lord. This is sacrificial worship. Now, you and I, we read this and we think, you know, wait a minute, this is why is there any need of an offering here? The sacrificial system, as you well know, it would have been well understood by those who actually were reading this because the event is a historical event and then it's recounted many years later by Moses by the whole power of the Holy Spirit. So the sacrificial system, especially from the book of Leviticus and following, has already been kind of doled out to the Hebrews. They have an understanding of sacrificial worship and bringing an offering before God. Some have insinuated that Cain's sacrifice was weak because there was no shedding of blood. Based on Hebrews 9 and verse 22, if you want that reference. But nothing in the text indicates at this moment that Cain and Abel are needing of forgiveness. They just want to bring their first fruits before the Lord. They want to worship God. No, the issue here is not necessarily one of sin per se, that they are offering up, offering for their own sin, that Cain has brought the grain offering before the Lord for his own sin. It's a matter of heart. Cain's sacrifice, Cain's offering is lacking as we shall see. It is a weak sacrifice. The other side of that is there is not only diluted worship, but in Abel we see Delighted worship. 
a willing sureness. Not only the weak sacrifice from Cain, but a willing sureness, understanding and trust in the sacrifice put before from Abel himself. Look at verse 4. And Abel on his part. He also brought the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And Yahweh, notice this, underline this in your copy of God's Word, Yahweh had regard for Abel and for his offering. That regard was not there for Cain. Why? Because Cain has has brought something that is less than. He has not brought his very best, but we see in Abel he has brought his best, the very best he had to offer. By the way, you also notice in Abel's offering, if you look at the different, some of the differences between verse 3 and verse 4, you know that there is much more description. You'll notice there's more description attached to Abel's offering. Cain offers a mere token gift. It brings up Acts chapter 5 when Ananias and Sapphira, uh, they, they, they brought forth an offering. Some say, why did God strike them dead? Because they didn't bring forth all. They didn't bring forth their very best. But here in Abel's sacrifice, it is not a mere token gift as we see in Cain's offering. But we see a sureness, an understanding that he is to bring his very best for God. He is willing, he is committed to bring his best before God. And notice there in the tail end of 4, and Yahweh had regard, notice this, for Abel and his offering. God always looks at the person and the heart first. He always looks at the heart first. If we are clutching clutching our resources and we're holding on to that and we say, I know God has called me to give and then I give a penny and yet I am very wealthy. God knows my heart. Jesus had something to say about that, of course. He talks about the, the widow's might. She was the least wealthy in the synagogue and yet she bring forth from all that she had. She offered up the very the very least amount, and yet before God it was the most. It's a matter of heart. A willing sureness is a matter of heart. I wrote down Psalm 40 and verse 8. I want to just read it over you real quick. This is a a text that speaks about about giving to the Lord and having the proper heart. Write down uh, Psalm 40 and verses 6 through 8. Sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. My ears have been opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Notice this verse 7. Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. This is where I got the sense of being delightful in your act of worship. I delight to do your will, O my God. Verse 8. That your law is within my heart. A willing sureness that the law of God is in my heart. I know that what God has required of me. And I am delighted to go and do such. I want to bring all of my heart before him. I am sorry, Lord, as Matt Redman said. I'm sorry for the thing that I have made it in my life. That I've made it about me. When it's all about you, God. We learn in Hebrews 11 that Abel's sacrifice is called by the writer of Hebrews, as we learned when we went verse by verse through Hebrews. We learned that Abel's sacrifice is seen as more excellent, is what the writer of Hebrews, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writes for us. More excellent. Why is it more excellent? Again, because he brings from the very best of all that he has. He brings, he brings the prize from the flock. Abel on his part also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. Notice the description there in the sacrifice and the offering. And Yahweh God had regard for Abel in his offering. A weak sacrifice in Cain, a willing sureness and delighted worship from Abel. We also see again a woeful situation. What comes about as a result of the sin and the lack of genuine worship in the heart of Cain? We see it play out in verses 5 through 15 quickly. Look at verses 5 through 15 of the text. And Abel on his, uh, excuse me, verse 5, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So God regards in the tail end of verse 4, Abel's offering, 
But verse 5, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry. Notice this. Cain was angry and his countenance fell. Then Yahweh said to Cain, why are you angry? Why has why your countenance fallen? If you do well, it is well for you. Will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do, do, not, uh, if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. In other words, if you don't deal with this this, this uh, depravity in your heart, this sin nature, this anger in your heart. Sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you. But you must, notice this, master it. Verse 8. And Cain told Abel, uh, told Abel his brother, and it came about that when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and he killed him. It's almost written as matter of fact. It's startling and stunning all at one time. Then Yahweh said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? That is the most interesting rhetorical question of all time. Yes, you are your brother's keeper, and yet you have slain him. God knows that. Verse 10. And Yahweh said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. You shall be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. That's the word for vagabond. You won't have a home. And Cain said to Yahweh, my punishment is too great to bear. Notice that Cain is not repentant. He's focused on his own punishment. Verse 14, Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden, and I shall be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth, and I will come about that whoever finds me will kill me. So Yahweh said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And Yahweh appointed a sign for Cain, lest anyone finding him should slay him. Much debate about that sign. I don't know what it is, perhaps a physical sign. Mark, but we see a woeful situation. In spite of the willing sureness and the delighted worship of Abel, we know that because of the weak sacrifice of Cain and his deluded worship, now we see a woeful situation play out. We see that Cain is angry, and the root of that anger, of course, is jealousy. He is jealous and envious of his brother, and it festers. And we see a gracious word of God. God knows what is coming. God knows what happens when sin and anger fester in the heart. The result is never good. It is only progressive. It is only more detrimental and more destructive. And God offers up a gracious word of encouragement to Cain. Turn away from this sin. Don't allow this anger in your heart to proliferate. But we know that of course, Cain did just the opposite. He did allow that, that, that anger and that sin to take root and that jealousy to take root in his heart. And based on his lack of genuine worship before a holy God, now he is jealous of God because God has regarded Abel who demonstrated authentic, genuine worship. He had the right heart. And so instead of working through his own sin, this sin proliferates and Cain murders. I wrote in my notes, I put murder with an exclamation point. It's so stunning. It's just out of nowhere. There's no precedent for this murder. The only other time that we have seen death up to this point is that when Yahweh himself graciously fashioned skins for the people, for Adam and Eve and garments that would cover them. But now we see the first murder of a human being in recorded history. And it is a clear demonstration of the proliferation of evil in the heart. The consequences of sin are great. Jesus mentioned this in Matthew 23 and verse 35. He talks about Abel being the first of God's people to be murdered. And then he mentions Zechariah, one of the last great prophets. To close out the Old Testament canon. And the key here is that 
The blood of Abel cries out as we see in the New Testament. And Abel is just a type. He is one of, the, he's, a, he's an innocent one that is, is a demonstration of the forerunning of one that will be totally innocent, Jesus himself. And now we see a curse of Cain. Before the serpent had been cursed, the ground had been cursed. You say, wait a minute, I thought, I thought Adam and Eve were cursed. Well, they received the consequences of their sins. But often biblical scholars indicate that here is the third curse. And this is a, the, the, really the first curse of a human being. Adam and Eve, again, receiving the consequences of their sin. But from Yahweh God, God is cursing Cain. Even as he cursed the serpent the embodiment of evil, the devil, and the ground. This is a hard thing to see, but it is a demonstration of a woeful situation. Deluded worship always brings about a woeful situation. It brings about deadness in the heart. When you and I are not genuine in our worship, it brings about deadness in our heart. And therefore, we cannot actively the way that we were always meant to be, always, always meant to function before God. We can't bring that, that willing, that sure sense of, of trust before God that He has told me to do this and I will worship in this way because I trust Yahweh. I am focused on Him. I am here for Him. Deluded worship always brings about a spirit of me and mine, not God and His. A woeful situation flowing from a lack of genuine worship in the heart of Cain. So a weak sacrifice, a willing sureness, a woeful situation. Now we turn back to the delighted worship. Notice the kind of the interplay here. Look at verses 16 and 19. In spite of the great sin of Cain, God will bless him and God will allow Cain to have children. And children are a blessing. Verse 16, then Cain went out from the presence of Yahweh and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. And Cain had relations with his wife and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city Enoch after the name of his son. Verse 18, now that Enoch was born Irad and Irad became the father of Mahuiel. And Mahuiel became the father of Methusael. And Methusael became the father of Lamech. We see a wonderful succession here from the the loving hand of God. Cain is not deserving of blessing, and yet any person that is a parent knows that children are a blessing. In spite of the great sin, in spite of even murdering his own brother, God allows the line of Cain to continue. Now, unfortunately, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree in the line and lineage of Cain because it's going to be, for the most part, it's going to be noted by by even the great sin of murder. The Bible tells us here that Cain went and settled east of Eden in a land called Nod. That's a play on words for the word that is used formerly in the last section that we looked at. This word for vagabond or wanderer, one who is ultimately separated from God. The further and further we get away from God... It demonstrates a lack of genuine worship. Uh, We see here in the text that Cain is geographically becoming more and more distant from the place that God had set for his people. And it's a, a physical, geographical demonstration that his heart is far from God. Again, he is not worried about repenting before God as we saw in the unit before. All he's worried about is his own punishment. We see that so often in our own lives and the lives of others. You see it so often with all these sexual abusers that get caught years later. So many of them are not, are not uh, uh, brought to a sense of repentance in their own heart. They're just sad that they got caught. We see that spirit in Cain. And yet God, being gracious and wonderful in his mercy, he provides a wonderful succession. He even provides children for Cain and his wife. The Bible tells us that uh, Cain and wife have a son named Enoch, and his 
name literally means dedicated. So there seems to be some sense here that, he, that, that Cain still understands that, that what is his, his children, if they belong to the Lord. And so he dedicates, he names his son Dedication. And that's the name of the city that is built, speaking to the proliferation of the human race at that time. By the way, again, the Bible over and over here in the Old Testament and the New Testament speaks of one race. I know the news, news people will tell you in school and the textbooks will tell you there are many races. That is false. There is one race, the human race. Within that race, there are many ethnicities and many backgrounds and distinctions that we could focus on. But there is one race. And Enoch is the dedicated one from the line and lineage of Cain. The Bible tells us that ultimately sin is prevalent again in the life of this one known as Lamech. And we see that he promotes a wicked standard. In spite of the wonderful succession that God allows this sinful family to be blessed in the succession and the birth of children. Ultimately we see that in one of Cain's children, Lamech, in the, from, from, from his, sired from his line, great-grandchildren, we see that Lamech is going to come and he is going to be murderous. He's going to have a murderous spirit, a wicked standard promoted in verses 17 through 24, finishing up quickly. And Cain had relations with his wife and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch and he built a city and called the name of the city Enoch after the name of his son. Verse 18, now that Enoch was born Irad and Irad became the father of Mahuel and Mahuel became the father of Methusael and Methusael became the father of Lamech. Here it is. And Lamech took to himself two wives. Notice this. Notice the wicked standard that is started here. Lamech took to himself two wives. The name of the one was Adah and the name of the other was Zillah. And Adah gave birth to Jabal and he was the father of those who dwell in tents and livestock. And Lotus, no, no, go down here to verse 23 and, and hear the boasting of Lamech. This, is, this man, his name literally means skilled in strength, but he's also a very arrogant and prideful man. Apparently he is channeling Cain and the spirit of Cain as well. Look at verse 23. And Lamech said to his wives, Adah and Zillah, listen to my voice. You wives of Lamech, give heed to my speech for I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. He's, he's celebrating murdering someone. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventyfold, sevenfold, seventy-sevenfold. Isn't that interesting? Notice the wicked standard that is brought forth by Lamech. He is so wicked that he even in, brings forth polygamy. This polygamy is never endorsed in the Bible, by the way. But we see this arrogant spirit to kind of flub the standard, the holy standard of God. It is the overflow of sin. I know we often focus on the homosexual community as those who have, have distorted the marital relationship in the marital bed. And they have. But did you know it actually was a, a, a heterosexual relationship? A man that valued more than one wife, he, he, he valued another wife. He, he was lustful, and he brought another wife in to the marriage bed. And that's where we see marriage has been forever tainted. That's the beginning of marriage being tainted after, after uh, the, the uh, inception of a man and woman for life that God had laid down and prescribed. Lamech distorts the perfect human union of the marital relationship. This is a wicked standard that proliferates and goes on to this very day. And we can lay it at Lamech's feet. We can lay it at the heart of sin, the lack of worship. We can lay it at a, a desire for a wicked standard and focusing on himself. Finally, the good news is there is good news even here at the tail end of this difficult chapter. Delighted worship, a wise supplication, a spirit of prayer. Look at verses 25 and 26 of the text. And Adam had relations with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed me an, another, an offspring in place of Abel, for Cain killed him. And to Seth to him also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. Then men began to call upon the name of Yahweh. This is not to say that this is the first time that there has been prayer before God. 
I just think there's something special that happens in this prayerful, this prayerful mindset and mentality. A wise supplication before the Lord and the blessing of the Lord. Abel is dead. Cain has been exposed, exposed from, from the area, from, from Adam and Eve. And now the Lord graciously gives them again. We see this wonderful succession, this, this springing from wise supplication. We see Seth has come into being. And his word means to place or to set. It's almost like he has taken the place where in Abel there was great sorrow to think of his life as a vapor. In Cain there is great sorrow to think of his moral failings and the fact that he is not with his family. But in Seth we see that there is a, 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 he's taking the place of the gracious goodness of God. And now joy, a delighted worship has entered into the existence of Adam and Eve once again. This is ultimately a text about the heart of worship. How do you worship this morning? We see it played out in two brothers. One had a deluded worship, a spirit of offense, a spirit of, of being jealous that led to anger, that ultimately led to the death of his own dear brother. And by the way, do not, do not look at your own life. I, I was praying about that and meditating on that, looking at the anger in my own heart, thinking about how dangerous it can be. Don't diminish that anger in your heart. Allow the Lord to say to you, may it be well with you and deal with this sin in your heart. But along with the deluded worship, we see a delighted worship. We see in Abel, we see a spirit to give all. And we see a, a spirit of, of receiving the Lord's blessing in wonderful offspring and children. And ultimately a spirit of supplication, a spirit of prayer. This is what it means to delight in worship, to focus on the one true God, to have your heart focused and filled with the affections of the one true God. Do you know the one true God this morning? If you know him, then you want to bring all that you have before him. No deluded worship, only delightful worship, knowing that all good things in your life are from him. And he is deserving of every bit of your attention and time and resource. Delightful worship. I pray it would be the banner cry of the people of Village Baptist OKC moving forward. That we would delight in the worship of the one true God. Did you know one of the most evangelistic things we can do is when the people of God, when we gather, that there is a festive, wonderful spirit of knowing I am going to delight in the one true God. God, not in a fakey way, but a genuine, authentic way. To understand that the one true God loves me and my life belongs to him, I belong to him, we belong to him, and we have the opportunity to gather together and bring about a genuine heart of worship. Where is your heart this morning, brother and sister in Christ? Perhaps you find yourself in here today and you realize you don't have a relationship with the one true God. Well, the Bible says you can experience delighted worship. You can experience restored, redeemed worship in and through the Son, Jesus Christ. Call on Jesus Christ. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe in Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done on the cross of Calvary for you and I and the sins of all the world. The Bible tells us he was crucified for our sins. And on the third day, he rose again according to the scriptures. He is a God of life and he lives today. And now you are called to commit your life to him with delightful worship, genuine worship, worship, filling the heart, authentic worship. Father God, we ask that right now you remind us how important it is that we come before you, that we bring our best before you, that we understand that our lives belong to you, that we understand that all the good blessings and benefits that we have in our lives are an extension of your loving, good, sovereign hand, and we have the opportunity to live our lives in such a way with genuine hearts of worship. I pray that we would demonstrate delightful worship even, that we would be excited, that we would be so stoked and so enamored, just passionate about who we are in King Jesus Christ, that when we come into these hallowed halls, we, we just can't help but, but shout and clap and worship you as the one true 
God. This is the genuine heart of worship. But right now, as the church gathered, it must be uh, seen among us right now. But here in a few moments, as the church scattered, may it be prevalent, may it be present and prevalent among us as we go back out into our city and love the city with genuine worship, telling them about the one true God who is worthy of all glory, honor, and praise. You are the only God, and we are to bring genuine sacrifice, genuine worship before you. I pray it would be in my heart, it would start with me, it would be with every person in this room, it would be in their hearts as well. Do your good and great work for your own glory, and may we worship you in genuine spirit and truth today and always. In the great name of King Jesus, we pray. All of God's people said. I'm going to ask you to stand right now during our time of invitation. I know this has been kind of a difficult message today, walking through this and seeing, the, seeing a, a man kill his own brother because of the anger in his heart. This is a historical event that hurts us. This first murder that has led to so many other murders in the timeline of history, even right now, there are people that are dying because of the violence and the anger that swells in our hearts. And we ask the Lord that it would not be so. We pray for the restraining grace and presence of the Holy Spirit. But again, if you just if you just want to come here and you want to demonstrate just kind of kind of a genuine posture of worship, I just want to invite, this is the most powerful, most important, important time of this morning, that we get to demonstrate a genuine heart of worship. And I'm going to ask you, unlike Cain, I'm going to ask you to come forward and demonstrate a heart of repentance. Not because you've been caught for your sin. Not because you are sad or fearful of punishment. No, because you are sad that you impugned your relationship with the Holy God who created you. You are sad for your, for your own wickedness. And you want the Holy Spirit to fill that, that place and eradicate that sin in your heart. Whatever the Holy Spirit is telling you to do, would you come forward? Will you listen to the Holy Spirit in this moment? This is our time to publicly repent before the Lord. I pray that you would.